homeostatic regulation or physiological regulation systems, then those systems really determine um, the um, our, our physiological needs and therefore they track the internal world. And so you can see that these two different uh, motivation governing systems, you know, interact with, with two different worlds, if you want. Uh, the reinforcement learning with the external world, how do you navigate to something that you want? In the homeostatic regulation system with the internal world, how do you define what is it that you want? Okay, and so in my talk today, I'm gonna to go over a little bit about some background on the two systems and then um, lay out uh, how we can link the two mathematically, which is what we did, and then uh, scroll through a whole number of uh, very nice properties that this framework ends up having, um, and uh, then give you some uh, uh, one or two examples of how this could be applied to explain experimental um, um, uh, data and then point out some future directions. Uh, and I think that I have a lot of stuff, but if you have questions, you can uh, ask me uh, during the talk. Okay, so let's think first about the reinforcement learning system or reinforcement learning algorithms um, that allow us to learn how to interact with the external world. So, uh, and really um, what reinforcement learning the goal is, is to learn uh, a sort of a common currency value for each particular behavioral choice that we can take. Um, so uh, in this sense that if we start from some, some state S1 and we have three particular action choices, A1, A2, A3, what we really need to know is which one of these is the best action to take, all right? So in order to do that, we can assign to each state action pair, and I'm gonna give a Q-learning as a exa paradigmatic example, right? We can assign to each state action pair uh, a value uh, or a Q value, right? Which uh, allows us to compare uh, these three actions amongst each other. So Qs are just numbers. So how do we learn these Qs? Well, let's imagine that uh, we choose to take action one, okay? So we take action one, all right? This action one transits us to the next state, state S2, for example, uh, makes us go near a, a bakery, okay? So N4 is, is, is an outcome of this action. We can now compute uh, the difference between uh, what we expected to get if we take this action and the reward that we actually got as a result of this action. So for example, if we don't expect anything, if we don't know what's going on, this Q would be zero. All right, so this is called the reward prediction error and that is the key to all reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay, and so now, after we've taken this action and transited to the state S2, where we got the outcome of that action, right? And after we have been able to compute this error, we can now, up now update the estimated value of the state action pair, S1, A1, by taking the old estimate and adding to it uh, 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 a term that is proportional to this reward prediction error, where the alpha here is, the, is, is called the learning rate. Okay, all right. And so now we can continue acting. Now we're in state S2. From state S2, we can take any number of actions, uh, which will apport it to a different state. And in fact, what we can do if we, can, if we know the state space where we can act, we can lay out by taking all the potential actions within the state space and observing the outcomes of transitions to all the potential states, we can fully lay out the state space map <clears throat> and the Q map for the whole state space, okay? And all of this can be done uh, essentially by following this very simple algorithm, all right? 
Now, um, for decades, uh, this was uh, basically in the purview of computer science or operations research, very abstract. And really, there was a key observation that was made uh, almost 20 years now, I think. Uh, no, actually more. All right, that showed that in fact, uh, neuronal activity, oops, in the, in the um, dopaminergic deep brain dopaminergic nuclei, in fact, uh, the neuronal activity of dopamine neurons follows precisely the dynamics that you want uh, if you were to use these neurons to signal the reward prediction errors. So here's the one of the most famous slides, I think, from a publication by Wolfram Schultz et al. All right. Um, that shows uh, that before the animal is familiar with rewards that are given <clears throat> and are signaled by uh, conditioned stimulus, you see a transient dopaminergic response on reward delivery. So just like a an error between expected and received reward, which then goes away when the animal has learned. And in fact, this transient response is now associated with the CS, which predicts the reward that will be received. And then interestingly, when you uh, withhold this reward, you see a dip or a pause in this activity, which is compatible with a negative reward prediction error. Okay. So now you can show this is, that this is a normative theory, that using these equations, uh, you can structure policies that will maximize uh, rewards and returns, future discounted rewards. And in that sense, it is normative and is optimal. All right. However, it leads, leaves a question. And the question, what is a reward? OK. So now the way usually these reinforcement learning models are structured are the following. OK, you can you lay out the state space. OK, you can lay out the potential action space. All right. But then you also define the reward schedule. So the rewards that are considered in traditional reinforcement learning approaches are really imposed from the outside. They're imposed a priori. However, when you think about natural uh, behaviors, right? Um, the animal uh, does not a priori know what is a reward and what isn't the reward in some sense. In another sense, this reward should really depend on the animal's needs that are based, uh, the animal's wants, if you want, that are based on the organism's internal states. Okay, so this is what we set out to do. And that is to understand what is the role of the internal state. Okay, all right. And in fact, uh, there's been a long history of work in um, looking at the role of internal states in control and motivation. Uh, and that's been linked to the homeostatic uh, regulation system. All right, okay. So, uh, and there are two interesting uh, facts that one should take into account. Uh, we should probably motivate ourselves by looking at internal states in the homeostatic regulation. And that is, it's been well uh, documented over the decades that uh, animals' behavior, uh, in, even in controlled experimental conditions, is, is variable even though the external environment, meaning the state space, the action space, and the reward schedule are completely fixed, okay? Um, and so one explanation for such variability is that what we're not tracking are the changes in the animal's internal state. For example, uh, it is routinely done that an animal will be uh, deviated uh, in some homeostatic modality in order to motivate it to do the experiment, right? If the uh, behavior is reinforced, reinforced in the experiment by uh, a food pellet for a rat, then the rat is actually deprived it, it, uh, of food and it is uh, in fact hungry when it starts the experiment. And um, um, so the second fact is that there is a whole host of physiological variables that have uh, 
stable or, or uh, let's say, homeostatically maintained uh, uh, values, right? And these values uh, appear to be maintained to some degree um, despite large changes in, uh, let's say, the inputs and the outputs of the, um, of the organism. Right? Our body temperature, core body temperature, does not deviate too much, whether we uh, eat or don't eat, whether we run or don't run, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right. Um, so, and in fact, we know that there is a whole host of, um, of neural systems that uh, bring information about the internal state and the physiology of the body to the central nervous system and signal it in the brain, uh, particularly through the arc complex and the lateral hypothalamus. Okay. All right. Oops. Now, um, traditionally, homeostatic regulation has been uh, modeled, meaning there's been a whole host of classical uh, modeling approaches to homeostatic regulation, and those usually fall into the purview of control theory models or control models, right? In these models, there is a sensor um, that senses the difference between some kind of a set point and an actual value of a variable, let's say temperature, right? Determines the deviation, right? And then, in fact, uh, um, uh, generates a corrective response all right, through, let's say, the motivational system, through the digestive system, through ingestion of the necessary nutrient, for example, all right? Um, and then, uh, depending on this particular response, determines whether that uh, was uh, brought you closer to the set point or further. And in fact, you can show mathematically that there's a whole host of systems that will optimally perform uh, control uh, to maintain stability of, of variables, right? And uh, uh, while the classical approaches were always corrective or reactive uh, control models of homeostasis, there are certain ones that have started to develop, to be developed over the past few decades uh, that are in fact predictive homeostatic models. And I think that our framework, as you will see, for, you know, sort of falls into that purview, okay? All right. Uh, but now the point is that uh, there are certain homeostatic responses or certain responses that you see um, uh, in the animal's behavior that take place before the internal state is deviated. And so these reactive homeostasis theories don't take that into account. Okay, all right. And so, uh, the thing about the homeostatic regulation that we really should know, I think that's most uh, relevant to our framework, is that indeed it allows you to decide uh, what sort of outcome is motivating the behavior. You know, am I hungry? Will a baguette motivate me? Am I thirsty? Will a glass of wine motivate me? Right? But what it doesn't tell you is how do you navigate through complex environments in order to get to, 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 to either one of these, right? But of course, we saw that the reinforcement learning system is the other side of the coin, right? It teaches you how to navigate through environments to get outcomes, but it doesn't teach you which outcome is the one that you prefer uh, depending on your internal state, okay? All right, yeah. Okay, let me sort of go on to that, all right? And so the open issue, again, for homeostatic regulation systems is, you know, how should the animal learn how to translate its physiological deficits into appropriate instrumental behaviors? You know, how do we actually navigate? All right. Okay, sorry. Okay. So if we think about it, the summary of the diff two different systems, the homeostatic regulation system and reinforcement learning system, are such that uh, they are complementary, right? One defines what is a motivation, meaning what do I want? The other one defines how do I learn about how to get there, right? 
There are complementary neural substrates that are in fact interconnected so that the homothalamic nuclei project to uh, dopaminergic system and vice versa, right? The behavioral adaptation that these two systems subserve are also different. Homeostatic regulation system adapts to internal states, all right? Whereas reinforcement learning system adapts to external cues, right? And if you think about it, the, 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 the sort of the, the um, a goal or optimality or, or um, um, uh, of the two systems is, is somewhat complementary as well. Uh, whereas reinforcement learning system, you know, uh, uh, te should tend to reward maximization, right? This kind of like a economic imperative, right? Whereas the homeostatic regulation system, you know, tends to deviation, uh, the minimizing internal state deviations. So uh, physiological stability imperative. Okay, and so what we did, okay. So this, I think I've uh, talked about, all right? And so what we set out to do is to provide a unifying framework. Uh, and in fact, it turned out not to be so mysterious to do so. Okay, so as I told you before, so uh, lateral hypothalamic nuclei that in fact gather information about internal states, provide direct input to the dopaminergic system Right. Let's say, uh, for example, in the ventral tegmental area, there are also other variables through various uh, hormones that provide homeostatic or internal state inputs to the dopaminergic system. And so we really have a, a biological substrate to be able to de define our theory. So let me see, let me sort of give you in a few steps how you can define this theory. Okay, let's start out with uh, not with an external state space, but let's start out with an internal homeostatic state space. Let's imagine that we're going to track two variables, uh, glucose and body temperature. Uh, it's been shown that both of those are highly regulated. Body temperature needs to be around 37 degrees for humans. If you deviate by more than two degrees or three degrees for any period of time, uh, you will near death. Um, and glucose also is highly uh, uh, regulated so that deviations in glucose uh, uh, can actually lead to uh, detrimental detriment to the body. Okay, so now let's imagine that this optimal set point can be represented in the space. So this would be 37 Celsius, this would be some glucose level, and we'll call it uh, a point H star. Uh, let's now imagine that our organism is not at H star, but it's somehow deviated. So it is a little bit low on glucose, or actually highly low on glucose, so it probably wants to eat, and it's a bit cold, so it probably wants to warm up. All right, so now on this homeostatic state space, we can define <clears throat> a drive function, which actually looks like an energy function, which has a minimum at the... Uh, at the homeost at the set point, right, and then defines uh, a sort of a, a drive landscape or an energy landscape around it. Okay. Now this function is uh, is parameterized by these two parameters m and n, all right, which we can uh, choose freely if we want in order to get different properties of this drive function. For example, m and n equal two, then we just get the Euclidean distance. All right, we get a, a, a classical energy function, right? We can choose them any way we want, essentially. Sorry, okay. Professor. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about a uh, drive function. Yeah. Uh, why uh, we choose N and M different? Uh, we don't have to, but actually, we could. Actually, it's, an, uh, it's a norm. It's a norm function. It is a norm. It is a norm. Okay. So, so, uh, for uh, uh, being a well-defined, uh, it's be, and being a well-defined norm, uh, I think that it, it should be um, equal this parameter. Uh, okay. N and yeah. N. Okay. If we want to keep it strictly speaking a norm, we can have these parameters to be equal. Uh, but uh, you will see that certain combinations of m and n give us very nice properties of this drive function, which then translate in 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 very nice properties of the 
of the, uh, let's say, valuation and the behavior that results, okay? Thank you. Yeah, so, all right, so now, uh, now we have well, essentially two, two, pro, uh, two uh, quantities that we can track. The actual deviation, so the actual distance between the set point and the body uh, state, right? And the drive associated with this deviation, okay? All right, so now let's imagine that we start out at this point and we take an action K, all right, which translates us uh, to a different place in the state space, uh, internal state space, okay? So then we can compute, of course, you know, it's trivial, right? There is a drive associated with this point, there's a drive associated with that point, and what we can define reward is the difference between this two, the drives at this point and this point, right? Which can be written like this, right? Where K is in fact the impact of an action on the internal state, right? Okay, so now in words, reward is now uh, the, um, the, the impact of an action uh, on, the, on the drive. All right, okay. And so now we can just put that reward, which is now defined with respect to the internal state variables into our delta equation, all right? And incorporate it into our Q learning or any other uh, reward prediction error based reinforcement learning algorithm, okay? All right. And so that gives us a homeostatic reinforcement learning system, or uh, otherwise we, with MEDI, we called it the homeostatically regulated reinforcement learning system. All right, okay. Uh, so, okay, so now to define the variables here again, right? So now the uh, K here, is the homeostatic outcome of an action, meaning what impact a particular action or transfer from state S1 to S2 or any other has on the internal state, okay? Uh, if an action uh, H is the homeostatic deviation, right? All right, and this little H is the, uh, is the actual location um, in the homeostatic space, okay? So now what do you get for free? out of this. So first of all, well, not for free, but by definition, uh, we have a, uh, a primary reward definition. So whatever outcomes have a, uh, an impact on internal state, uh, they will be uh, uh, rewarding uh, if they, in fact, um, uh, if an action or an outcome of an action reduces the deviation in the homeostatic space, all right? And in fact, uh, by, by definition, also any action that increases the deviation in the homeostatic sp state space is uh, punishing, right? Any actions or outcomes that don't have an impact on the homeostatic sp state space uh, have no primary rewarding or punishing value, okay? All right, okay. The other thing that you get for free, it, almost instantaneously you can show that um, uh, the Q values for state action pairs or the, the values for the state action pairs are in fact regulated by the internal state, okay? So which means that the same, um, the same uh, uh, sort of dose of outcome, right? The same action uh, will be in fact changed in its valuation depending on the, on the organism's internal state, which is uh, exactly what you might think you see in behavioral experiments, right? It might explain satiety, for example, right? So the closer you are to the, to the um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the closer you are to the, to the uh, optimal point, the lower is the value of a particular state action pair, okay? So basically this is all the theory, right? This is, this is the framework, right? Which is the, and the key is the definition of the reward 
with respect to the internal drive. Okay, so now what we can do is we can show that in fact this is a normative theory and that meaning that uh, within this theory uh, maximizing rewards or maximizing reward collection is identical to minimizing deviations uh, so that reward imperative is in fact physiological stability imperative. Okay, all right, and so the proof of this is quite, mm, quite simple. So we can define uh, two key quantities. So we can define uh, a sum of discounted deviations, right? Where this eta here is the discounting factor. It should be less than one, okay? Temporal discounting factor. We can define the sum of discounted rewards like this, all right? Okay, and it's uh, quite simple to show that uh, action policies that minimize some of discounted rewards will maximize the sum of this, uh, sorry, minimize some of discounted deviations will maximize the sum of discounted rewards. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's similar to Bellman equation. Uh, yeah. 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 It's not, you know, it's not rocket science, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, which basically says that if you have an algorithm, right, that, uh, that, 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 you know, that agrees with the Bellman equation, right, this, uh, and with the reward defined as we did it, this algorithm would also maximize physiological stability, all right? Okay. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, skip this, uh, this sort of sketch of a proof because it's just algebra, okay? So it's just basically rewriting the sum of discounted rewards and sum of the sum of discounted deviations. Uh, okay, but the key is actually here where you end up uh, with the sum of discounted rewards essentially being proportional to eta minus one sum of discounted deviations, right? Which means that if eta is less than one, maximizing this will minimize that, all right? So which means also that for almost for free, we sort of get a, a, a less ad hoc, let's say, a less heuristic reason for temporal discounting. Uh, in the sense that within our framework, temporal discounting is the key to be able to maintain physiological stability through maximizing uh, reward, um, uh, reward harvesting, okay? Now, so that's, um, so now we uh, already we have very, two nice properties. One is that for free, we get um, uh, value modulation by internal states and we get a sort of a less ad hoc uh, or, you know, a, a reasoning for why uh, we should discount rewards in the future, right? But um, on, on judicious choices of the M and N parameters in the drive, we can also get a bunch of other very nice uh, properties, which I'll, I'll sort of go through uh, some of them uh, right now, okay? Uh, okay, so now if we uh, start with our drive function and our reward um, definition, now if we make M bigger than N and bigger than one, actually this, should, this, is, a, uh, this is an old slide, We've now been able to show, show that it actually just needs to be bigger than one, okay? Then what you can show is that the rewarding value uh, of actions increases with the dose of outcome, which is exactly what you should have, right? So the uh, <clears throat> derivative of our reward with respect to K, which is the outcome is bigger than zero, all right? which uh, also can model the fact that you get higher breakpoint and progressive ratio schedules uh, as the outcome becomes bigger. Okay, so that makes sense, good. All right, uh, so now you can also show that the same dose of outcome uh, has a larger drive, uh, the larger the deviation, uh, the deprivation level becomes. Okay, so this is again, uh, quite easy to show mathematically, 
all right? Which means that the same amount of, let's say, food uh, will be prized more the more the animal is deprived, which is exactly what you also observe in behavior. Okay, that's also good. So we got this for free uh, with just a choice for the N and M parameter. Okay, we can now look at how irrelevant drives um, affect uh, our rewarding qualities of a particular outcome. So now we can uh, to to look to, to think about that is that you know the we're deviated in the food direction, right? What happens is that what if we now you know change in the drive in the water direction, which you know doesn't give get us closer to the um, to the optimum, right? And what you can in fact show is that uh, irrelevant drive has an inhibitory effect on the on the reward, all right? Meaning that the reward uh, value of a particular outcome in one di dimension direction, right? Uh, decreases as you deviate in another di uh, dimension, all right? So now, uh, this is also something that um, at the time we didn't think about, but actually what it implies is that this algorithm will in fact result in, in, in uh, uh, satisfying multiple constraints at the same time if it, if it finds, you know, when it finds optimal policies, these policies will in fact satisfy constraints in the food and the water direction at the same time. Okay, all right. Uh, but there's, uh, but this sort of inhibitory effect of irrelevant drive actually has been observed in, in classically in, in, um, in uh, experiments looking at consumatory behavior. For example, thirst impairs pavlovian responses for foods, all right? And then reciprocally food deprivation suppresses pavlovian water-related responses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, all right. Okay, so now what you also get uh, for free um, is um, the fact that our agent, so this homeostatically regulated reinforcement learning agent is also loss sensitive, right? Or it's loss averse. And that's also fairly easy to see. So now if you define the same outcome in the direction uh, towards the uh, um, the um, <clears throat> homeostatic point and away from the homeostatic point, if you define the drive function appropriately, like we did, right, the equal drive lines compress, and therefore uh, the drive for the negative perturbation, uh, sorry, the drive change for the negative perturbation would be in amplitude larger than the drive change for the positive perturbation. Okay, get, again, fairly easy to see. So, which means that the negative rewards accorded by uh, uh, deviations away actually are bigger than the positive rewards accorded by the deviations forward, and that will lead to agents that will preferentially avoid taking deviations. So, they're loss sensitive. Right? Okay. All right, so now one more thing that we can get for free out of this is risk aversion. Um, so that uh, under the definition of our drive function like this and the reward like that, all right, we can show that in fact uh, it has a negative curvature with respect to the outcomes, right? So that when we compute the, dry, uh, the value function, all right, uh, we can sort of see that this value function is uh, concave, no, convex, all right? Uh, so, uh, you know, almost what falls out out of a def our definition of the drive and the reward is that we have a theory that is compatible with the, with the neuroeconomic theory or behavioral economic theories of valuation, all right? So, so our, our agent is now actually risk averse. All right, and in fact, we can do a, 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 a simulation of risk averse behavior where we simulate, um, you know, a, a virtual mouse uh, that or a rat that can choose between two different outcomes. Uh, one outcome that has low um, dose, but with high probability, right, and uh, another outcome that has a high dose with um, low probability, 
right? And what we can show, so this would be the state space for our experiment, right? So two states, uh, low risk, low uh, payout, high risk, high payout, okay? Um, all right, and what we can see is that um, uh, if we start our mouse in a non-deviated state, then readily our mouse learns to take, uh, in fact, to seek the low risk uh, option, okay? All right, now we can also um, sort of um, rerun this experiment now in a, in a different situation where we start our mouse being hungry, meaning it's deviated, right? And what we see is something interesting. So now we deviate the internal state, all right? And we see that in fact, our, our virtual mouse uh, does a reversal behavior, sorry, uh, where it starts out by seeking large outcome risky uh, choices. And at some point, in fact, switches to low out, uh, small outcome, but, but uh, uh, risk avoided, avoiding behavior, all right? And in the process, it in fact uh, uh, optimizes its internal state, all right? So these kinds of things are observed uh, in animals, all right? Now we've worked on a human version of this task, um, which predicts also that you should see these sort of switches between high risk and low risk behaviors depending on the internal state, okay? And we're pursuing this, uh, these uh, testing these sort of tasks uh, with my colleagues in Moscow now, uh, applying, uh, trying to apply this uh, homeostatic principles also to the monetary domain. Okay, all right. So now as I alluded to before, uh, not, uh, you know, it's been shown that animals are able to, in fact, uh, act to potential internal deviations in an, an anticipatory fashion. Uh, this we do every day ourselves. Uh, we eat before our sugar levels plunge. Uh, we go into the warm room before our temperature, body temperature uh, plunges, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a whole host of anticipatory behaviors um, that, um, that have been shown in animals. So there's anticipatory eating and drinking. Uh, there is anticipatory salivation in response to food associated stimuli. So classical Pavlovian, you know, Anton Pavlov's experiment, right? Uh, it's been shown that uh, insulin secretions in, increase prior to meal initiation, right? When you see food-related cues, right? And the one that we actually decided to um, simulate is anticipatory shivering. Uh, okay, so, oh, right? So the experiments that have been done to test anticipatory sh shivering are, are, are done in this, uh, in, in, in this, in the following fashion, right? You have a, a rat, uh, uh, the rat receives a conditioned stimulus, let's say a bell ring, all right? And then it's doused in cold water, or for example, so as to, to, to deviate its body temperature, right? And what the rat, uh, what, the, what, what happens is that after a few trials, the rat uh, starts to shiver on delivery of the CS, right? Classical Pavlovian response, to a future deviation. Now, the important thing is that at the CS, the rat is not cold, right? It just expects to be cold later on, okay? So reactive homeostasis control theories, models, right? Cannot handle that, okay? But we can do that with our, uh, with our framework, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, so appropriately, the framework learns that in this state, where nothing is happening and there's no CS, it should not shiver, okay? Uh, in this state, when it's actually uh, deviated in its temperature and in its internal state, it learns to, uh, to generate the shivering response. Most interesting is what happens here, okay? All right, okay. 
here in this state, during the presentation of the CS, early on, appropriately also logically, our agent chooses not to shiver, and then progressively it learns that in fact that it should start shivering here predictively on the delivery of the CS. So again, we see this behavioral reversal uh, as a function uh, with, you know, of trial number, but actually this reversal is also a function of predicted learned changes of the internal states, okay? Okay, so now if we look at the internal temperature, simulated internal temperature, we see that progressively as the agent learns to predictively shiver, right, uh, this internal temperature becomes and continues, learns to be stable no matter what visiting state the animal takes, including this one, all right? But it's, it's interesting to look at what happens in more detail if we blow up the time, all right? So during this initial learning of the predicted deviations, you see that these uh, negative temperature deviations that are ported during this deviated state, right? And then what you see is that eventually the agent starts to learn to, in fact, increase its simulated temperature by shivering predictive to this further deviation down, okay? And then when it has learned to maintain its average body temperature uh, constant, on the average, actually what you see is that it's producing these predictive positive deviations, all right? And thereby it's minimizing these negative deviations that are induced environmentally to its internal state. So you can compare uh, the troughs here to the troughs here, okay? So we have an agent that has learned to generate predictive or anticipatory, corrective or protective internal uh, state response to environmental impact of its internal state. Okay, so now you can use exactly the same logic to look at experiments that have been done to uh, understand how alcohol tolerance might uh, arise. Okay, so these alcohol tolerance paradigms, um, in fact, uh, build on the fact that alcohol is hypothermic so that uh, if you inject an animal with alcohol in addition to uh, environmental change that induces temperature deviation, uh, this temperature deviation in the versus cold will be exaggerated or increased by the alcohol in the dose-dependent manner, okay? So here's a classical experiment and the data from Mansfield Cunningham, um, where in fact they showed that um, uh, uh, injections of alcohol uh, uh, sort of from control levels induce significant temperature deviations. I believe it was in rats. Okay, and interesting that there is a time course during sessions, all right, that you see this decrease followed by an increase. Okay, and then as the um, number of sessions in the acquisition blocks and, uh, increases, meaning the more the animal is exposed to this procedure, uh, the less is this alcohol modulated hypothermic response, okay? So the question is, you know, is this a physiological adaptation or is this something that is learned? Interestingly, uh, when they do a catch trial where they don't inject alcohol, you see that the body temperature of the animal actually deviates above uh, 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 normal control, okay? Uh, and so uh, the idea here is that the animal starts to, uh, so our idea was that the animal learns to generate a predictive shivering response that is modulated not only by uh, what it expects, uh, the cold water stimulus, but also by the internal presence of alcohol of, of, of um, <clears throat> alcohol, all right? So we were able to model this, all right? By first, in order to model this, we needed to uh, make a simple model of pharmacodynamics of alcohol uh, in the body, which we modeled as a alpha function, all right? Uh, 
okay, with uh, appropriate time dynamics that we roughly uh, aligned with data, okay, all right. So from this pharmaco uh, pharmacodynamics response of a, uh, sorry model of ethanol in the brain or in the animal, right? We propose that the animal generates a tolerance response, which would be, for example, dependent on shivering. Okay. All right. And it's the combination of these two, all right, that actually governs what happens to the internal state of the animal during uh, a temperature deviation uh, and alcohol uh, um, injection. Okay. And so now we are able to write down our state space for this experiment, okay, where we get uh, S naught is the, is the CS. Uh, and the S1 and S2 are the tolerance response or the null response. And then we have uh, body temperature measurements uh, during the experiment. Okay, and we're, we're uh, sort of to cut to cut to the chase. Sorry. Uh, basically, our HRL agent uh, is able to reproduce this experiment. Okay, including the catch trials. All right, uh, suggesting that in fact alcohol tolerance can be explained as a learned predictive tolerance response. Uh, of the organism to the uh, temperature deviations due to the environmental factors and the pharmacological effect of uh, alcohol on uh, thermal regulation. Okay. All right. Uh, how am I doing for time? Oh, I have a, a few more minutes. Uh, how much time do I have left? Well, approximately 10 minutes. Okay, good. I think I can wrap up in these 10 minutes. Okay. All right. So, so what we can learn from these uh, sort of forays into anticipatory responding is that, you know, what it shows is that, you know, the response is a conditioned, right? And it can explain alcohol tolerance as a learned behavior. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, we we uh, we know that animals are capable of learning not only Pavlovian but also instrumental anticipatory responses. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So um, now we can go one more step further, uh, and that step uh, was actually motivated by uh, some facts, um, some fairly old experiments that showed. Um, that direct deviations of internal states um, are not very efficient uh, at uh, producing uh, conditioned responses, right? So for example, uh, intravenous uh, injection of uh, sucrose it has only limited <clears throat> effect on conditioning and uh, intragastric injection of nutrients actually does not so much, you know, does not easily respond and uh, uh, result in conditioning. And so what we reasoned is that one of the reasons why this could be is that the, 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 the temporal contingencies are not fast enough, right? So if you intragastrically inject nutrients, these nutrients have to be digested, uh, absorbed into the bloodstream, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, you have a problem with essentially credit assignment to the stimulus and uh, in a particular in the outcome in the internal state. Okay, all right. However, uh, when we consume food, we have very rapid and direct uh, information about its taste quantities that impact uh, through the uh, opioid receptor uh, signaling on the dopaminergic neurons. Okay. And therefore, uh, we posited that in addition to internal state deviations that could be slow to take, all right, um, we could incorporate into our reward definition the sensory properties of, of food outcome, all right, that, that is consumed, consumed as, a, as a result of a particular action, okay? 
All right, and so we can posit, or what we did is we posited that uh, the sensory properties of a food, of a particular consumed food, let's, let's say uh, K hat here, right, is, um, should give an estimate of the nutritional content of that outcome. Uh, given, you know, taking that uh, assumption or ansatz, uh, we can extend a little bit, not very much, but we can extend our, our definition of the reward, okay, where instead of the actual internal impact, internal state impact of a particular outcome, we now we can incorporate instead of that the uh, sensory estimate of that outcome, all right, which is sufficiently rapid enough physiologically. Okay. All right. Interestingly, so now while our reward is defined with respect to the sensory impact of the outcome K, the internal state is changed by the actual impact of the outcome K, all right? Okay, uh, and as I was telling you, that resolves certain problems with the basic model, all right? Uh, so uh, certain facts that dopamine neurons show almost instantaneous responses to unexpected food rewards, right? And that, as I was telling you, that the intragastric intubation and intravenous injection is not really rewarding, although there is some new work that points out that this is really nuanced, all right? Uh, and also the fact that, you know, palatable foods like saccharose does have reinforcing effects, even if they don't have any nutrition allowed. Okay, so um, now uh, based on, uh, you know, these assumptions actually hidden in these assumptions is a, what I think is a very interesting idea. And that is, um, you know, the, the, the taste properties of foods really should be an unbiased estimate of their internal state impact, okay? But what happens when those when, when this uh, sensory properties of food is not compatible with, a, with the nutritional impact of those foods? What would happen um, to our uh, 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 agent, okay? So for example, what if we have a highly palatable, highly palatable or a hyper palatable food uh, whose taste uh, in fact, deviates uh, strongly from its, um, its, its impact on the internal state of the animal, right? So we can model that uh, by suggesting that in addition uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the internal impact of the food, we have a term T that in fact uh, 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 models the excess of palatability, all right? Okay, all right. And so we can um, simulate a very uh, simple experiment where we ask uh, what is the consumatory behavior uh, or, or seeking consumatory behavior of um, this hyper palatable food uh, with respect to uh, sort of uh, you know, regular palatability foods, right? And so, uh, again, you, you know, what uh, you don't have to think too hard about it, but basically this additional bias term leads to a persistent um, overconsumption of this high, highly palatable foods in the sense that the agent learns uh, behaviors that in fact lead to persistent positive deviation of its internal state, okay? So now if you couple this with a storage model, you will in fact see that the storage will get loaded, right? And this might be uh, a minimal model for um, sort of aberrant food, food consumption, so which could lead to obesity, right? Um, now, if we do a choice, simulated choice experiment, again, between healthy foods, uh, all right, and hyperpalatable foods, all right? Uh, so for our simulated agent, what we see is that, uh, in fact, the agent, again, has a switching behavior, all right, to uh, these, what we call tasty foods or hyperpalatable foods, 
right? And again, this leads to, in, to a persistent positive deviation of the internal state. Okay, again, pointing out that this simple uh, discrepancy between the sensory and the physiological impacts of a particular food source would lead to pathological choices or preferential choices and pathological overconsumption of that food. Okay. All right. Uh, so that what this is what we've done over over the years, uh, and in fact, uh, in fact, that points out to a number of potential future directions. So one is to consider not homeostatic but allostatic models, uh, where in fact that um, you allow for uh, uh, feedback, uh, let's say from. Uh, dopaminergic systems, for example, uh, to internal state controlling system and therefore adaptive uh, changes in, in, the, um, in the set points, which now become not set points, but setting points, so they're dynamically uh, maintained and how we can, uh, in fact, uh, incorporate that into uh, our, um, uh, our, our theory which might explain uh, progressive uh, onsets of obesity and drug addiction. And in fact, we did get to that, but I won't have time to tell you about it. I have some slides afterwards uh, where we uh, worked together with Serge Ahmed to explain uh, uh, cocaine dose escalation uh, and relapses, all right? Uh, so another one is we might want to uh, step back and to say, okay, well, we've given a physiological definition of reward, but we might have just swept the hard question under the rug because we proposed an ad hoc drive function, which is very difficult to observe, right? It's what con you know, converts internal state changes into motivational uh, drives. All right, and with Oliver Hume, in fact, we started to delve into that and propose that perhaps the origin of the drive functions could be explained from population survival curves, and therefore the drive function could be an individual instantiation of a kind of a more ecological or uh, a, 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 a sort of observation on uh, the, the probabilities of survival. In fact, you can sort of mathematically show that uh, uh, drive and probability of survival are related. Okay, and then uh, a third uh, uh, potential future direction which already people have started to take is to go beyond uh, uh, what we did is to think about uh, internal states uh, as being primary physiological internal states and rewards as being based on primarily physiological needs and outcomes, right? And try to apply this more to secondary rewards like uh, uh, monetary rewards. Uh, in fact, there's a very nice uh, TICS paper from uh, uh, Chris Sommerfeld and his uh, former student, Juchems, uh, who argue for uh, applying our framework, in fact, to uh, multiple constraint uh, uh, satisfactions uh, problems in the monetary and economic and social domain, all right? And so, and furthermore, we've been uh, applying homeostatic reinforcement learning principles um, uh, to simulate uh, in simulations of financial markets to see how uh, internal states of trading agents might change their success uh, in their trading strategies. Okay. Um, all right, I think I should be stopping now. Right, uh, so I'm going to skip all this good stuff on modeling uh, escalation and dose dependent relapse and just finish with the conclusions. And so, uh, of course, my conclusion is going to be, uh, uh, you know, very optimistic and self-laudatory. So we started out with uh, two systems that govern two kinds of uh, 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 behavioral uh, phenomena, so reinforcement learning system that governs how can we learn what we should be doing to optimally collect rewards, and the homeostatic regulation system that defines what sort of things should we treat as rewards, 
and how much should we consume of them in order to ensure physiological fitness and stability. And we put them together and I think in a very simple way, which actually has been able to generate quite a few results, uh, uh, in, you know, not only intellectually, but also publication wise. So here's a list of certain publications that we've done. And I want to, uh, again, thank my funders uh, and thank the Group for Neural Theory. Uh, this is a very old picture. And this is when we could still travel before the confinement. You know, and as a take home message, I think you can go back to a song by the Rolling Stones that says that you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you might just find you get what you need. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Doctor, for uh, joining us today. Let's uh, move uh, to question part. If anyone has any question, uh, please do ask. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, such interesting topic and such interesting presentation. Uh, I have some questions, mm -hmm. uh, but so um, currently, uh, uh, I, actually, I'm a master student of, of uh, Jamal, mm -hmm. and uh, um, currently I'm uh, working on uh, modeling some uh, reinforcement learning uh, models, and uh, combining uh, these models with um, uh, some uh, diff diffusions um, um, mm -hmm. and uh, modeling uh, the learning procedure and. Uh, dynamics of uh, decision making uh, together mm -hmm. and uh, it's in uh, actually uh, the um, uh, homo homeostatic reinforcement learning uh, uh, if i uh, understand correctly is a map a mapping uh, uh, with um, uh, actually it's obtained from the reinforcement learning and it's just a uh, 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 redefining it and uh, some uh, some map uh, between uh, the uh, some external uh, uh, some internal uh, parameters and uh, the reinforcement learning. Uh, yes. It, yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, actually, it it is interesting for me uh, to uh, to uh, modeling uh, the uh, homeostatistical reinforcement learning with. Uh, a, with uh, some drift diffusion models, you know, uh, combining the uh, time and reaction time with a homeostatistic uh, reinforcement yeah. learning. Yeah. Uh, is it possible or is it uh, interesting? Is it a uh, right idea? Uh, and uh, can we uh, do this? Maybe. Uh, yeah, let me think. I mean, do I know any work that combines reinforcement learning and, and, uh, and uh, reaction times. Yeah, the problem that I'm sure there is some. I mean, I know that people have um, I, I know that there's been quite a you know a bit of work on looking at re, uh, reaction time data and 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 sort of confidence of outcomes, right? Yes. So that's almost classical, you know, sort of sensory detection tasks, right? Uh, the, the, the more you're confident that you're right about particular, uh, you know, identity of a stimulus, the faster you're going to make the response, right? Um, now, it could be also, it, it would stand to reason that the more you value a particular choice, the faster you're going to take it, right? Thank you. Uh, I mean, it would stand to reason. I mean, I, I don't know the data on that, All right? So then, then my, you might imagine that you could incorporate, you know, uh, uh, the uh, expected values into uh, into a drift diffusion model as a, you know, let's say that as uh, a as a as a drift parameter, for example, right? Uh, and then this homeostatic reinforcement learning will allow you to see how to scale those, uh, those parameters as a function of the internal state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, another question that I have uh, is about uh, uh, your tasks. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, every, um, every uh, uh, the experimental task uh, that uh, you were on was um, on, uh, on animals. Uh, yeah. uh, I have some question about uh, the participants and uh, the uh, task procedure. And for example, can we uh, run um, some similar uh, some similar uh, design on uh, humans? Um, and uh, I, uh, the other question is about the. Uh, your uh, your experimental design. Uh, actually, uh, you run a, a kind of a, a value-based decision making. Yeah, between, uh, yeah. Uh, between uh, some uh, uh, fruit or uh, a mm -hmm. kind of uh, another food, you know. But uh, can 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 we extend uh, this model for uh, some uh, um, some um, uh, you know? Um, in a kind of, uh, uh, I forgot the, the um, perceptual decision making, you know, some, uh, some uh, task that uh, not uh, uh, any sensible uh, value for, uh, for, for the participant and just by uh, ma uh, making a perception from, uh, from the image uh, can uh, make some uh, 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 changes in uh, uh, body temperature or uh, another. Uh, oh yeah, um, in, in human, uh, in human uh, participants. Yeah, yeah. So, um, actually, I, I I I don't know. All right. So the so there's a, a, a few issues here, right? So with Ali Hume, we try to do a human version of this. Uh, for example. Um, risk avoidance task, right? Um, uh, try to see the behave, uh, the reversals. Uh, and we try to do that pharmacologically, or Ali did, uh, by trying to deviate um, uh, humans by, you know, in, 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 uh, 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 in their glucose content by giving them drugs, essentially. Uh, we um, never managed to, to get them controlled enough to be able to see anything reasonable, right? So, so first is that uh, if you want to deviate internal states, that has to be invasive, right? With humans, meaning that you would have to do it uh, pharmacologically, okay? All right, uh, which is uh, pretty difficult to do. Second, uh, in, a, in a safe manner, right? Uh, second is that it's quite difficult to do that in a co controlled manner. Right. The reason why uh, we simulated these animal tasks is that these experiments have been done for many, many, many years. And in animals, you can really, uh, you know, control or track the internal states in a reasonably decent manner. Right. You can continuously uh, take blood sample samples or, you know, sample uh, body temperature by an invasive probe, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. So now. That's one, uh, that's one or two questions. Uh, the third uh, issue that I can see is that, you know, if you really could in a controlled manner show that certain stimuli, sensory stimuli, uh, rapidly alter uh, internal states, then yes, that could be done, but I'm just not aware of those stimuli, right? Um, now, in the model that we did for uh, cocaine, uh, dose escalation and cocaine addiction, um, uh, we did have to, in fact, uh, extend our framework from just value-based decision-making to a model-based system, right? Uh, where we proposed, in order to explain certain aspects of, uh, you know, relapse, we proposed that, in fact, what, what is represented in the brain of addicts um, are at least two kinds of environments. One is a drug-free environment. Another one is a drug-available environment. And the valuation for behavioral choices is not the same between the two environments. And therefore, uh, uh, drug-associated cues 
in fact, flip the, the, um, the subject from one environment to another, and, and the switch does not entail just change in the valuation uh, lookup tables, but also uh, in the uh, a change entails a rapid, you know, remapping of the internal state. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, so maybe one can conceptually think that, uh, you know, drug associated cues or in drug addicts or alcohol associated cues in alcoholics, uh, in fact, have a, a, a rapid impact uh, on the, on their, on the, on their uh, brain representation of their internal state. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that, you know, so that in fact, this is sort of a computational uh, instantiation of this idea of, you know, cue induced craving. Yeah. You know, okay. Th thank you. Will. And yeah. uh, um, my last question uh, is about the uh, parameter of uh, the model. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, can you summarize the three parameters of uh, the uh, model and uh, the interpretation of uh, each of uh, parameters? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me think about it. Okay, so first of all, of course, it's a, a, you know we 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 sort of use Q learning, right? So it has the three parameter of the uh, parameters of the Q learning, which is uh, pretty much the learning rate, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So that means it's one. Okay. So then there is the uh, uh, the drive function parameters M and N. M and N. Okay. Uh, and then another uh, parameter that is observable, but not necessarily easily observable, is uh, is the set point location. Point location. Uh, the uh, this, optimum point. point the location. optimal location. All that could be measured. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So really, minimum we're talking about three parameters, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for you're your. You're welcome. Interesting uh, presentation and your complete uh, answer uh, to my questions. Yeah, pleasure. So with this, uh, we, th I, we thank you for your time, and uh, you. uh, yeah, and we thank you for joining us today. So, and that's it. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.